You might have seen the title of this video and thought, that's not me. I've done a good job at growing my wealth for retirement. While that may be true, your decisions around money, whether saving, spending, or investments, were seldom rooted in sound logic. But you're a logical person. You know you are. You've never made any terrible decisions like moving to cash in the midst of a bear market. But what you didn't realize is that there were other biases present. In fact, you may be even more successful than you are today if you had known about their presence. All investors will face some of these at some point or another. Even me and my team are affected by these, despite being aware of them and professionals that work in the business. But I'll share ways that have helped us be aware of them so that it can help you make better financial decisions. And the last one that I cover, you're not gonna wanna miss. It's one of the most influential in helping you to build your wealth and retirement plan. So here we go. Investing might seem easy when you are shoveling money into your retirement accounts, investing aggressively, and looking away for 20 or 30 years. But that feeling goes away once you realize that now you're close to retirement and you're gonna start to use that money you've saved. I've worked with retired feds for a long time and I've noticed that people tend to feel differently about their investments as they get closer to retirement and beyond. What if the markets go down at the same time? What if they take too long to recover? Surely your C fund or S&P 500 investments will come back again. They always have, right? While that may be true in the long run, these cognitive tendencies that we have in the business are called behavioral finance. In fact, there was a Nobel Prize that was won in this very subject. In its simplest form, it states that decisions around money, especially your investments, are not rooted in sound logic. If you're human, you have some connection to your money, whether you realize it or not. And most of the time, we make decisions without recognizing what's going on in real time. Here's the first example. If everyone is investing in something and it's going up in value, there's a tendency for our wanting to participate in that as well. If you see your colleagues TSP balances all going through the roof over time, but yours is just barely trailing along, at some point you're going to start asking yourself if you made the right decisions. This is formally known as herd behavior. In the late 90s, everyone was investing in internet stocks because of how well they were doing. Last year, everyone was investing in NVIDIA because of how well they were doing. We have some clients who never watched the markets or definitely not individual stocks, and yet they were asking us if they should own NVIDIA in their retirement plan. They were influenced by what was happening around them rather than objectively thinking about whether NVIDIA actually belonged in their portfolio. And we all know what happened with internet stocks. They completely collapsed with many of them never recovering. What was it that drove people to invest so heavily in those stocks? Or what is it that drives you to want to invest in the C fund or the S fund or any investment? Just because something has gone up so much recently, does that mean that it will continue to do so? This is known as something called recency bias. And it's another form of behavioral bias that we encounter as investors. You have to be aware of the reasoning behind your decisions or risk them being bad decisions. Now, on the other hand, we have the exact opposite. There are those who say the S&P 500 has gone up so much that it has to fall very soon. This is a bias known as something called loss aversion. And it's often rooted in the desire to preserve their wealth and what they have rather than what makes logical sense for their plan. I've spoken to countless federal employees in 2024 who were confident that this year would be volatile in the markets. And subsequently, they've missed out on 15% growth in the S&P just so far this year. This form of loss aversion can be further explained by looking at how someone feels when they find free money. Imagine for a moment that you're in the parking lot and you find a hundred dollar bill on the floor with no one around to whom it may belong. You're thrilled because you're now a hundred dollars richer than you were a moment ago. So we've got happy feelings. And now let's imagine that instead you found two $100 bills on the floor, but moments later you lost one of those bills. How do you feel now? Well, now we are less thrilled. The end result is exactly the same in both circumstances you are $100 richer than you were a moment ago. The amount of utility and happiness that you gain from finding $100 should be exactly the same as finding $200 but losing $100. But the reality is that most people will always view the second scenario as much worse than the first. And from a logic standpoint, this just cannot make sense. But I see investors do this every single day. Think back to January of 2022. 
your portfolio was probably the highest balance it had ever been at the time. But the rest of the year proceeded to take back a huge chunk of those gains from you. The reality is that by the end of the year, the majority of people still had much more in their portfolio then than they did a few years prior. But it was hard to find anybody who wasn't upset with their investment performance that year. The concept is the same here. Our decisions around money are heavily influenced by our past experiences. I have clients who had parents who were babies of the Great Depression. These are people who are often quite terrified of the stock markets and are very frugal with their resources. In finance, there's a bias that we call money scripts, which are subconscious beliefs that we have about money. Ted and Brad Klontz developed the most common money scripts that investors experience. The first one we see is called money avoidance. Maybe it was hard financially growing up and looking at account balances was always stressful. This has often led to an avoidance of tracking on how you're doing today or an avoidance of doing the kind of planning required for your long-term success. The thought of the unknown is just too difficult to come to terms with so we just avoid it. Another is called money vigilance. This is similar to avoidance, only someone is hyper aware of their spending and savings and may be overly cautious with money to the extent that they may even deprive themselves of the things that make them happy. Another one is money status or worship. This is where someone may feel better or worse depending on how well financially they're doing in any given moment. Sometimes people may find a sense of self-worth that's correlated to their financial worth and that having less means they're less successful. Another way this manifests is one that everybody knows, retail therapy. Everybody loves to get new things, whether it's clothes or gadgets or tools, whatever. But this should not be what's driving your sense of happiness and fulfillment. Remember how I often define a successful retirement plan, living a retirement with dignity and financial independence. Note that nowhere it says have more money. The reality is that we often live with these illusions, rarely becoming aware of them. Many investors undergo something called mental accounting, which is when we look at sums of money differently, depending on its source or intended use. Now, some of this can be good. For example, we often use the bucketing approach when working with clients on an investment plan, and that can be helpful. But other times, it's quite harmful. For example, someone can feel good about having a bank CD that's paying them 4% in interest. But at the same time, have other loans like a mortgage or credit cards that might be 15% interest, 6% interest. And the reality is that they are losing more to interest than they are gaining. But this form of mental accounting can often mislead people to make less than ideal decisions. Another way to look at this illusion is to imagine a year where your agency, instead of giving you an increase of salary through a cost of living adjustment, they actually determine that they're going to reduce your salary by 3% that year because inflation was flat. On the other hand, if you were to receive a 3% increase to your salary through a cost of living adjustment in a year that there was 6% inflation, you would likely be a whole lot less upset than this first situation where they reduced your salary. The 3% pay reduction with flat inflation is deemed far worse than the 3% increase to salary with 6% inflation. But the net result is exactly the same in both circumstances. And the best way that you can fight against these kinds of normal biases is to be aware of them so that you can know and recognize when they appear. By having a formalized plan in place, you are forced to face these kinds of issues with an objective in mind, rather than having to rely on a gut feeling or nature to make the right decision. But even then, a formalized plan might not be what you think it is. In fact, many financial plans are quite worthless. Sounds contrary to everything that I'm saying, right? Well, you can see what I mean by watching this video on your screen next. Until next time, stay wise and stay wealthy.